Good morning, everyone. To Middleton Place Plugged History. Um, this morning it is Thursday, so it's Hands On History Thursday. And this week we are doing interpreter spotlights. So we are here with Doug Nesbitt, who has been the Cooper for Middleton Place Foundation for, oh gosh, how many years, Doug? Oh, many, many. <laughs> many, About many years. years. And we are so fortunate because Doug actually has um, additional interests to Coopering. And one of those is what he's going to talk about today. And it has to do with um, the age of sail and how people moved on waterways back in the 18th and uh, early 19th centuries. So um, Doug is here to share with us his passion and his talent and another way that connects uh, particularly enslaved uh, Africans and African Americans to the plantation here and a wonderful skill and passion that we wouldn't have the interpretation for if Doug weren't here. So uh, make sure that you drop your questions in the comment section here. Say hello, let us know where you're watching from and I will make sure to ask Doug the questions that you have so that he can answer them. All right, thanks very much for watching everybody. Doug, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karen. It's a pleasure to be able to interpret this history. Um, I've actually been sewing and stitching longer in life than I have with traditional woodworking. My father was my first teacher, uh, and in examining the history of Middleton Place, I found sail making and canvas work was almost as important as woodworking because they delivered rice uh, in ships uh, owned by the Middleton family all up and down the coastline. Uh, they had schooners and sloops. Um, and there were people, of course, plying the waters of the Ashley River to get in and out of Charleston. So sail making uh, and variants of that would have been very important. Um, I don't pretend to be a complete sail maker. I bill myself as a, a sail maker's apprentice. I've been doing it maybe for five or six years. Maybe I've been promoted enough to become a, maybe a mate. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but today I wanted to share with you some of the basic tools of, of uh, canvas work and sail making, not so that you can become a sail maker per se, but I find it it's an avenue of making very interesting and useful objects with your own two hands, not with a sewing machine, but with needle and thread uh, and cordage, uh, things like bags. Uh, the Diddy bag is one of the most familiar with its seam stitches. We're going to uh, get into some of that. Uh, clothing that is put together. Here is a, a coat that I made. Uh, bags and satchels of all kinds can be made very simply. The nice thing about canvas is there's no front or back uh, to it. It's the same on both sides. The stitches are very large. Uh, I suppose if you were to compare it with sewing, it would be the difference between driving a car and driving a truck. Uh, the stitches uh, are, are, are big. Now, we're going to be working with bigger than these. Uh, but these are made with big, big needles, and, they are st and, and you push the needle through with a palm, which is a thimble on a harness. Uh, to, uh, to drive that needle. Here is a needle and you would drive that through the canvas if you've got several layers uh, then that becomes very helpful. So we'll be using the palm but if you don't have the palm which costs a little bit of money uh, there's always the awl and if you have thick material uh, pre-punching it with an awl is also a very useful um, alternative. Uh, you've got to be very careful because needles are very sharp. Uh, also your thread can uh, become pre-waxed like this linen thread uh, which is a wonderful marvelous work to work with. It's a little on the expensive side. You can buy commercial hemp uh, from a from a, uh, a store, uh, a cat craft store or a box store uh, that also can be waxed and that becomes a very very sturdy material. Uh, you can even take away take apart rope. Rope. This is what sailors would call rope yarn, and you can see how it wrapped around in kind of a coil, and uh, you can straighten it out, and you can even do some of your wrapping uh, with some of that material too. So it's it's fun to take apart some of the very fabrics of it, when I look at paintings of, of sails in, uh, in books, it's amazing that they were made one stitch at a time. 
um, and, and that took a tremendous amount of time and effort. So in my work, and I've got a fragment of a, uh, of a sloop square sail right here uh, with the, the openings that attach it to the, uh, to the spar, which is the crossbar, um, uh, it, to know that this is only a small fragment of, a, of probably almost an acre of canvas that you would have to, to stitch by hand, uh, probably several people doing it, is quite amazing. Uh, so I thought I would begin by showing you one of the very basic stitches. Uh, those of you who have sewn before are for, probably familiar uh, with the, uh, the, the, the whip stitch. Uh, this is just basically going round and round. Uh, now folks, as Doug does this, you don't have to have canvas and hemp cord and a needle in order to do this. Um, you can do this as a craft activity at home. Um, I prepared a version of this right over here that you can do with cardstock or construction paper. Punch a few holes in it, get a length of yarn, put some tape on the end of the yarn, and you can do exactly the same stitches that Doug is showing us here. So, so they wrap just around. Just a little creativity. And just wrap around like so, just like a whip stitch, and that would be good for the bottom. Uh, of a bag that you might want to do and you could leave it showing on the outside or turn it inside out uh, to make it uh, virtually invisible. Um, another stitch I want to show you which is probably even more important um, is what's called the flat seam stitch. You might recognize this as a kind of a flat fell stitch in sewing talk. In sailor talk this is called a flat seam stitch uh, and they, the pieces, the panels cross over. This is, this is how sails were attached to one another from two foot wide panels. Um, the, the stitching is not like a running stitch. It, it's perpendicular to the stitch line. Um, and it becomes, uh, it's a very, it's similar to a, to a uh, whip stitch too, but it's much stronger. So you would put the needle in through one side and pull it all the way through. And do that. Now I have pre-punched these holes to make it a little easier to find these things. Um, and the needle can be a tapestry needle. Uh, if you're first starting out, you might want to pick something even blunter if you've made pre-punched the holes. Whoops! <laughs> and there goes my prop right here. Okay. Historic glasses are giving me trouble. There mm -hmm. we go. All right. Now that stitches together all the way up and down there. And then this would be reversed and they would turn it around to the other side. And you can see here how this would be the open seam here and that would be stitched across. Um, so the, the general effect uh, is to have a, um, a stitch that looks a little bit like this right here. Here is the outside that I stitched, and then I turn it inside out, and this is the inside where you see those uh, stitches just bearing across. Now, some sails were done additionally uh, with a running stitch down the middle, and the sailor would call that uh, sticking the sail, or sticking the, the stitches in right down the middle for, for even more, even more strength. Um, so those two are important. But there comes a time when sails will rip out uh, in the wind. Uh, and of course, that's a very dangerous proposition uh, because if the sail rips, what are you going to do? Well, you can repair it very quickly. Um, it's upside down. This is a rip, an intentional rip. Uh, and here we use the herringbone stitch. And I'll be honest with you, it is one of my favorite stitches. So. Again, I'm going to put that in through there. Go under on the side. Come around through. Pull that tight. Now I'm going to go on the outside and go in. Now Doug has a hands-on workshop for these kinds of stitches because especially for the herringbone here, you can see it's going to close up this rip very nicely. So you don't just have to use it on a 
a sale. Not everybody's selling sales. Um, but when you come back out to Middleton Place and we get our programming going again, um, we should be able to figure out and find a way to have Doug do these um, workshops again. And I took the first one myself, and I'll tell you, I struggled with the herringbone, Doug. It was not easy. Um, it looks it's like a, a herring. Stitch. It looks like a herring because here are the bones, and here's the backbone going down straight. Mm -hmm. uh, and a larger view of it, uh, if I might turn this over, uh, we would have it coming across like this. And uh, here I'll change needles out. And so these are um, these are stitches and tasks that enslaved men and women would have known how to do and would have been um, tasked with here at Middleton. Yes, yeah, we we have records that uh, there were eight schooner crewmen for one of the one of the uh, schooners that plied the waters of the uh, of the uh, coastline. Uh, probably there was a, a, a uh, sailmaker among them. Mm. Just get it comes across. Ah, there we go. I want to go on the top side of that. So that's where the line is formed. I've skipped the stitch there. So again, it's from the underside. Underside out. And this is great. So these are the kinds of things that uh, you can see when you come and visit Doug because we do have a boat in our stable yards here, Perry Auger. We call it the accommodation. Um, and the accommodation would have had a mast and a little sail on it. Um, but where the accommodation survives, of course, the sails do not. So this is a really wonderful um, addition to hopefully your visit here at Middleton Place. So that comes um, across kind of like that. To bring that accommodation to life. I have a an example of how that would be in an actual project. Um, whenever you want to just make a closing up of the, of the edge of a bag, that becomes a very attractive thing. It's it's similar, again, to a whip stitch, but it has a kind of a decorative line to it. Uh, so you might make a small bag for a, a tablet uh, or a notebook or a book, for instance, uh, the Arts of the Sailor or something like that that you might want to have uh, as part of your research. Uh, uh, but these, uh, these types of objects are very handy. There you see the other side of it right there. Uh, there's the flat seam stitch. Uh, and I've done running stitches there too. And so what got you interested in learning about this particular aspect of history? Doug? Well, I was looking for another outlet. Um, I, I sew historic clothing uh, to some extent. Um, and I wanted an alternate craft area. I'm a maritime history buff. Um, and I picked up a book called The Sailmaker's Apprentice, uh, which showed absolutely clear, beautifully drawn uh, examples of what these stitches were and I said well, I can do that, I can do that. I'm left-handed so I had to turn the images around because the, mostly books are written for right-handers. Uh, the, uh, the palm that I have, uh, as you probably noticed, I'm stitching with my left hand as opposed to my right hand. Uh, but I found it very clean and orderly uh, and I was especially attracted by the fact that the stitches are so big. There's no effort to try to hide the stitches, um, and you don't have to worry so much about turning things inside out. I'm a, I'm a sort of a, an image-based person, and I have to see things, and when I even build something, a, a fabric piece of clothing, I have to make a model of it and, and literally rehearse it to make, am I turning this under just right? What's it gonna look like when I finish stitching it? Uh, and with canvas work, you really don't have to do that. Uh, it's very, very, uh, it's very straightforward. Uh, it's almost like lacing, really. Sure. Um, and uh, I find it a lot of fun and very relaxing. During the day, I spend a lot of time interpreting and working with wood. And uh, evenings, um, uh, I find it just relaxing to come have a complete change of pace and put together useful objects. Uh, 
Uh, we have a saying in living history that you can never, never have enough bags. Yeah, There's always true. more bags and pouches uh, <laughs> that you can acquire. Uh, these things can cost a lot of money, um, but it's, it's a lot of fun if you, can, uh, if you want to make it yourself, you have uh, something fun to work with. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned The Sailmaker's Apprentice. I love that book. It's a great book. If y'all have any interest in maritime history, you should probably get The Sailmaker's Apprentice. I mean, it's a practical book. There's not much history in it, but um, I love the title of it because in the 18th and 19th centuries, The Sailmaker's Apprentice is very much a real person, not a book. Um, and Jamal spoke a little bit yesterday about apprenticing in, in a blacksmith shop or something like that. Would the same sort of system be true for enslaved watermen? Would they um, have I an think, apprentice system? I think they would. I know uh, specifically with woodworking that they, they would bring their children along into the trade. I think the same would be true of a sailmaker. Now, uh, uh, if he was a sailor, he would be gone from home for uh, fairly long periods of time. Um, and I can envision that this would be a wonderful way of him bonding with his children, uh, particularly sons. We find a kind of a gender specialty. Uh, nowadays, a lot of people think in terms of sewing and stitching as maybe a woman's kind of work, but there were most of the sailmakers back then were men. Uh, and with these big stitches, it's very strenuous work. You've got huge pieces of canvas that you have to work. Um, and uh, I, I would think that they would teach their sons. I think an apprenticeship for slaves in the artisan areas usually began around the age of 10 or 11 or 12. And they would be at it full time probably by the age of 18. 18 and 19 were the age of, uh, of adulthood in the slave world. And they would be a full hand, uh, rated as such. Uh, if it was in the, the, uh, the freedmen's world, it would be a journeyman as opposed to an apprentice. But in the slave world, uh, that, uh, that junior um, sailmaker or half hand, as he might be called, would be a full hand. Uh, and probably would be pretty valuable uh, in terms of that. Now, it's interesting that you bring up the fact that watermen are away from home, away from the plantation site for days at a time, and that might be uh, some new information to our guests and our audience. So, could you talk a little bit about how somebody could be an enslaved waterman, but spend time away from the plantation and, and how that system worked? It probably was a privileged occupation that only a, quote, good slave would get to do. And it would be handed down from father to son, probably. Uh, and there, I think, would be strict controls on it at first, maybe short trips, uh, to, to, be, to be at liberty off the plantation in itself, even though there was hard work to be done, was a tremendous privilege. Uh, and with, with the privilege went great responsibility. Uh, so it's not that they were totally unsupervised, um, but the fact that they were uh, on their own uh, and delivered rice, you know, in some cases even, even the captain of the ship, of the sloop or the, or the, um, uh, uh, the uh, schooner would be enslaved also. Uh, these had to be very responsible men and if they ran away, uh, they would never probably get that kind of job again. And uh, it was the kind of carrot and the stick. You, if you tow the line, uh, you might get to keep the job if you ran away. Uh, not, nobody knows what would happen. Even in the face of that, there were frequent runaways any, anywhere in slavery uh, culture. Sure. And uh, some things to think about, folks, is that there wouldn't necessarily be a whole lot of incentive to run away if a man has a family on a plantation, then um, he is incentivized to come back um, and to keep his, keep his responsibilities. So it's the same kind of thing that we have talked about in other programs here where um, there is some sense of just enough of an idea or a thought or a feeling of some sort of agency given to enslaved people in order to uh, keep them in that condition. And so um, it's really interesting to think about that, that these uh, pretty much always men on sure. the water um, were entrusted to go and, and then to also come back. Um, but it makes perfect sense when you think about it. It's part of that sort of 
psychological game that enslavers are playing. It becomes a playing. part of what scholars like to call accommodation and resistance, which was a kind of a seesaw power struggle, usually very subtle, very subterranean, people accommodating where they had to and resisting where they could, resisting in sometimes very small ways and very subtle ways. Um, and artists and slaves, I think, had a greater sense of self uh, than others, uh, and they could assert themselves. And there are many anecdotes of, of uh, when they felt that they were pushed too far, uh, they, would, they would assert themselves, even though they were at the risk of being punished and maybe sold away and never see their family again. Sure, a little more overt, the resistance. We did have a question come in. Um, was the canvas made at Middleton? No, that's an excellent question. The canvas in the 18th century was all imported, and it was made of linen, very heavy linen, and the best linen uh, canvas in the world came from Russia. And England bought the Russian duck, as it was called. Uh, now we have cotton duck that you can buy in a, a department store. But the Russian duck was purchased by the English and then resold to American colonists for what they needed in the earlier years of, of the colonies uh, for sale making or whatever they needed. When we get into the Revolutionary War, there's a tremendous conflict there because the English did not want the colonists uh, to have canvas for their ships or for their uh, tentage for their, for their soldiers. And canvas became very, very scarce. There were a few linen mills that would cre uh, crop up up in uh, uh, northern uh, New England. Mm. Uh, and, and that became, a, it was a very precious material. Interesting. And now it's... Cotton, you said, but... Cotton is mo uh, most day-to-day uh, -day, uh, canvas for day-to-day -day use is cotton, cotton duck. Uh, now, sales today are made mostly of Dacron and other synthetic materials. Sure. Uh, and it's mostly done, obviously, today with a sewing machine. Uh, so lots of changes have taken place there. It's a big sewing machine, I should think. <laughs> <There's a laughs> lots of them. Yeah, just wanted to look at your um, handicrafts here again. Uh, Doug made all of these things, y'all. Every I single made, stitch by hand. Every single stitch. And I don't know if you can tell, but the tablecloth that he has here set up on this table and up on that uh, rise up there, this is all one sewn piece. I mean, it's multiple pieces, but he's sewn it together. This is a sail. So it's not a tablecloth. It's a sail. There's a commercial uh, scene there. This is, uh, I, I sh to be perfectly honest, this is um, uh, an adaptation of a painter's drop cloth that I scrounged nice. <laughs> to practice it with. Works. So there's a commercial line of stitching right there. And you can see it's see a flat tiny seam. Those, uh, flat seam. Uh, but that's a running stitch compared to the very big and clunky flat seam stitches that I did. Uh, so but I was given, this had just enough mill. I wanted to, to have a kind of a worn sail for interpretive purposes. Uh, this could become a, a shelter tent at some point. Uh, I'm still working on it. Uh, uh, so it's a little bit of a work in progress. Yeah. I bring this out uh, during special events such as plantation days or living history days in the fall. Um, so we, we, all, we offer some of the alternative uh, crafts and trades at that time. That's great. Um, we have a couple more questions. First, do we know where the term duck came from? Yes, and I forget the exact term it came from, but it's a foreign word. <laughs> so it's like an English adaptation of it's a... It's a Russian term. I gotcha. Duck, ooh, and I can't remember, but it's short. It's a shortened version of, a, of another word for linen canvas. We'll look it up for you, Pat, and we'll figure it out. Um, Bonnie wants to know, did they ever use hemp? For sale. Yes, yes indeed. Hemp was also a material. Sometimes hemp was interwoven with linen for very strong storm sails. Uh, so, so hemp was another uh, material for, uh, for, for tendage as well as for the, the, the rope or, or the line that was used in the making of the sail. Sure, and you all can see that Doug now, This has... is manila right here, uh, but, uh, but hemp was another material for cordage. Um, I don't think folks know, but they should, that uh, boats carried extra sails. So when you were talking about for tentage, right, they would take sails and make shelters out of them? Yes, they would. I mean, they would scram. They would not throw away hardly anything. The sail, sail cloth was such a, a precious material. 
Um, and I believe that back on the plantation, if there were worn out sails in their inventory that simply were beyond use anymore, they would be uh, given back to the plantation farm crew uh, for, for local use, uh, either maybe as a ground cloth for shearing sheep, uh, maybe temporary uh, tarpaulins for uh, care of other animals, uh, uh, maybe bags or satchels or things like that. Cut up for clothes, maybe? Possibly clothes, possibly clothes. Um, so the Ashley River here is a tidal river. Um, but sailing and using the wind would have been involved in shipping rice down to Charleston as well as just relying on the tides, is that correct? Yes, I, I think I read in, in Williams Middleton's um, uh, writings, he said it was 15 feet deep at high tide uh, and around 7 feet deep at low tide. That, that's about the draft of a, of, a very, uh, of a small boat, like our accommodation, that would step a sail. Uh, certainly not a tall ship, but something <laughs> probably pretty small. Well, yeah, they need to have a shallow draft if we're talking about a <laughs> seven-foot depth total in the um, off-tide, um, slack-tide. So um, if anybody else has more questions, I, I love seeing those questions come in. Oh, gosh. I'm, and I turned it to myself. Hi, that's my face. There I am trying to turn my screen back. All right. Did artisan privilege include better food, housing, etc., for artisans and their families? In some cases, they did. Um, they, the, the woodworkers I know, I uh, know more about them, received an extra ration. Um, gift giving was one of those expected privileges. Uh, Food was doled out at Christmas time, especially. The, the artisan would probably get an extra doling out of fresh meat or rice. Rice was often held back. They knew how much the slaves liked rice and wanted rice, so that's the thing they held back. No, no, you don't get rice unless you are really, really good. Most of the time they got uh, corn. Uh, and so that would be one of those carrot and the stick kinds of things. If you work really well, uh, then you might get the extra thing. Or they could be withdrawn at the blink of an eye. Gotcha. Thanks. I don't, um, y'all, I, I only just saw your <clears throat> messages about us being static filled, so sorry about that. I did unplug the directional mic, so hopefully it sounds better now. Um, make sure to give us your questions. For some reason, my Facebook didn't scroll, so I just, I just saw a bunch of comments and other things. It's better. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, all right. So is there anything else that you haven't told us about sail making, about watermen in the 18th and 19th centuries? Not really, except that from the, from the slave's own point of view, uh, to become a waterman, again, was a bit of an escape. From the plantation, sometimes sanctioned, sometimes not. Uh, we have some records that uh, some of the artisans, particularly the woodworkers, would deliberately dress like sailors. Now, sailors didn't have a uniform, but they had a kind of a familiar clothing. Uh, they had loose trousers, they usually had a blue uh, jacket to wear, maybe a stocking cap, and some of the artisan slaves would, would deliberately dress as, as sailors to sometimes slip away and join the crew of a sailing ship. And few, sometimes few questions could be, would be asked because a crew was often multiracial. Uh, sometimes they were freedmen, sometimes they were slaves. Uh, they had been freed. Uh, in, on some ships, there, there would be few questions asked. Um, in fact, when they were brought into harbor, it became a, a custom to Brit put the black uh, sailors under lock and key on uh, in Charleston, probably at the uh, at the the arsenal, what is now the arsenal, which would be a, a kind of a prison or the workhouse, to make sure that they didn't escape into the countryside, and they would be incarcerated for the time that the ship was in harbor, and then taken back to their ship. Oh, interesting. So, so that was a possibility too. And it's interesting that you mentioned about the clothes because what you described for clothing is the exact same clothing that a free European sailor, a free, you know, Europe, 
person of European descent who was a sailor for money would be wearing. So there's no difference in costume there. They would, they would blend in. Another interesting sideline to that was the color coding of some issue clothing. They found that some of their most, they would give uh, their most trusted slaves a blue shirt or jacket. And that was to signify that this was a good slave, could be trusted, might be allowed to deliver messages out and abroad uh, in the local community. And the fact that that person was wearing the blue jacket uh, signified that, that he was probably okay. Uh, he would probably have, he would still have to have a, a pass probably. But the blue jacket was a signifying uh, uh, symbol of uh, this is a good person. This good person could be trusted. Interesting, interesting mindset from the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and we did have some folks come in a little bit later, so if you wouldn't mind reiterating about the boats that the Middletons owned. Well, the boat, they had several. I know the, the one that gets the most uh, uh, notice is the, the good ship uh, Henry Middleton. I think, I'm not sure if it was a schooner or a sloop. I think it was a schooner, and it was entitled the Henry Middleton. Uh, and I think it plied the waters... Um, up and down the coastline in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, in fact, it is said that the ship's bell from that vessel is now on display um, in, um, uh, at Middleton Place Stable Yards. Uh, it's way, way, way high atop the very edge of the building. Uh, on the, I didn't know that's supposed to be the ship's bell. That oh, bell, neat. That little bell at the peak of the roof on the, on the Texas side of the building, it's said to be the ship's bell, you know, the ring off, ding, 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 for the hours, uh, it's said to be the ship's bell from the Henry Middle. Oh, I love it. That's a great oral history. I'd love to find out if that's true. Y'all, I learned something today. I learned something every day out here, but that's a fun one. Um, all right. Well, if y'all have any other questions, please make sure to drop them in the comments. Um, we would love to answer the questions for you. If uh, we can't do it ourselves, we'll be sure to ask Doug, of course, and get his answers, and then we will type them into the comment section for you. Uh, we're going to join Doug again tomorrow. Doug will be joining us on Friday afternoon for History Unplugged, our History Happy Hour series. So we're going to get this sailor some grog. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about his interpretation here at Middleton Place. So um, if you can join us tomorrow at 5 p.m., we'll be talking a little bit more with Doug about his journey in living history and at his five, career. At 5 p.m., it will be two bells of the first dog watch. There you so go. <laughs> it's a good time to up spirits, as they used to say. It is. I think it's a splice the main brace. Yes, That's what splice we said. the main brace. <laughs> all right. Kind of splicing, I really do really well. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Every time you engage with uh, Plugged Into History and our digital platform here, you help us forward our mission of um, connecting people to American history and through that history, better understanding ourselves and each other. So thank you so much, Doug. Thank you for sharing this passion and this wonderful craft with us. Thank you for showing us uh, an aspect of enslavement from a plantation that most people probably don't really think about and make connections about. We really appreciate that. So thank you. thanks very much. We'll see you tomorrow.